now i am privileged i am obliged to the organizers for making me a chairperson where none other than kamini rao madam is speaking now she will be giving a keynote address with art in couples with rpl a double whammy now over to you madam i want that everybody should give a standing oration to madam because she is the senior most one and who has started art i thank the organizers of the sr a 28th annual conference particularly nandita and sujata who have been heading silence team, please who has been heading this team tirelessly showcasing the tradition of a risa and of course a fantastic scientific program now when they asked me about art and they also said tell us something more about reproductive pregnancy loss so i wondered what is it that you want to know more about uh, reproductive loss and why is it a double whammy so then i told myself let's just look at why does she say it's a double whammy it is a complex health challenge no universally accepted definition ashri rpl is defined as a loss of two or more pregnancies and includes also biochemical pregnancies what is excluded of course ectopic pregnancies molar pregnancies implantation failures and epidemiology shows less than 5% of females experience rpl so when we look at recurrent pregnancy loss as is estimated it is at best a guesstimate and if it is a guesstimate then we have to be very clear because many fertile women may think it is their first pregnancy but it may be their third pregnancy because they would have actually had a missed period or they would have just thought it was a delayed period and that could have been a period which is just washed out as a delayed menstruation so we are really under reporting recurrent pregnancy loss we really don't have the authentic value so keeping that in mind we have what is the double whammy here it is a two fold blow or setback from the oxford dictionary the two setbacks here are the recurrent pregnancy loss and then trying art in such patients you are trying art in patients to be able to give them good embryos but the implantation part of it is another thing that is a big stumbling block because implantation holds the key for the success of an ivf program so you are being hit on the right side by the recurrent pregnancy loss and on the left side by the, uh, the art so from the impact on the patient it's a very negative life grief uh, negative life uh, event it intensifies the grief experience emotional impact on the couple and loss of hope and plans invested in that child what do i mean by that i had a couple coming in to the clinic and they told me doctor everything is all right but just as i cross 6 weeks of gestation i start having scratching at the side of my lips and i know i am going to adopt so she had conditioned her mind that as soon as it starts scratching you know scratching on the lips that she is going in for that abortion so it was very difficult for me to understand how scratching of the lateral wall of the lips is going to cause her an abortion and then i told her look just don't come here and she had already had three abortions i told her you go to your guruji okay and he will give you some patta and whatever people trees everything and he'll make you go round that katte or whatever it is so that if pray hard i think this must be some of the sins some rishis had done and therefore it is there in you and he has to come out i don't know how many rishis had caused a problem so all these are coming out and the sins are taken out through your body sometimes you have to spin a yarn to take these things out of the mind of that person so very comfortably she went across to the swamiji 
and the Swamiji kept doing with a whole lot of these wild leaves. I don't know what the leaves are, but she took that and kept on getting the husband to wipe it on her um, lateral sides of the lips. And this he did for one month. And then when she conceived, he continued her to keep on applying. And what he did very clearly was giving her timing. You must do exactly at 8 o'clock and then exactly at 12 o'clock. Don't miss this side or that side. Look at your watch and exactly at 4 o'clock. So her whole mind was actually attentive only on this procedure. She couldn't think of anything else other than that. And that entire 12 weeks passed and she was still putting that on the side. So what happened was the mind was almost diverted. The pregnancy continued and we didn't have a problem. How many doctors of us really take this kind of a time to actually actually train the mind, condition the mind because a whole lot of these RPL also can be psychosomatic disorders as well. So this intensified grief has to be understood by understanding the patient. Emotional impact on the couple is also important. You don't know what is the story at home, mother-in-law, whatever, whatever. So in trying to react to the mother-in-law, perhaps even if she has not said anything also that she might say. So those are the things that you have to address at home. The socioeconomic status, loss of hopes, etc. You will have to give her all the kinds of hopes. So this is a chapter in itself, grief counseling. And this has to be addressed. In this, you will have at least a one in three cure for recurrent pregnancy loss. The impact of the recurrent pregnancy loss on the doctor is challenging because 50 to 75 percent, that is three quarters of recurrent pregnancy loss has no known cause. However, several or too many variables are there. Extensive investigations need to be and may be in all cases. However, if you were to look at this, the primary uh, uh, recurrent pregnancy loss without previous ongoing pregnancy, that is viable pregnancy beyond 24 weeks of gestation, you have one pregnancy loss, <coughs> one pregnancy loss, second pregnancy loss, third, and then you suddenly have a live birth. Here, there is no successful pathological proof of conse consecutive versus non-consecutive loss. So here what happens, it could be an embryo problem which would have corrected itself and she lands up with a successful pregnancy. Here what happens in a non-consecutive pregnancy loss, you have a pregnancy loss, you have a successful live birth and then again you have a pregnancy loss and a pregnancy loss and here less than 10% of recurrent pregnancy loss couples have non-consecutive pregnancy loss. That means you have one successful pregnancy, you have a couple of abortions and then you may have another 24 week pregnancy. So the etiology is going to be different in these cases. What is important is in most of the cases you can't find the etiology. So you either go for immunological problems or you go for genetic problems. And in such cases if you find the genetic problems obviously you know that the euploid embryo gives you much better success rate than aneuploid embryos. So if all of them can be taken up for PGTA testing, then you will be able to find out which is the best embryo to implant. So the etiology here is a big list, a thrombophilia, immunological factors, thyroid dysfunction, luteal phase defect, hyperhomocysteinemia, insulin metabolism disturbances, genetic factors, uterine malformations, male factor, and unexplained infertility. Now this unexplained infertility is very vague. It depends on where you're working. And 50 to 70% is what I say, but it would be anywhere between about 5 to 10%. Now in the maternal age, okay, in the maternal age, you will see that the risks of RPL increases with age and the number of consecutive loss. In the uterine pathology, congenital, septal, arcuate, bicoronate, and bicorporal uteri, acquired endometrial sinicae, polyps, uterine leoma, all these things have to be ruled out. In genetic abnormalities, embryonic chromosomal heteromorphisms, parental karyotype abnormalities, 
And if you look at infectious agents, the pathogenic infection agents decrease lactobacillus concentration and, and, and abnormal, this is something that is coming up more and more now, is the endometrial microbiome. Because of the numerous antibiotics we give and of course the uterine infections which are partly treated, these are very, very important. Now, thrombophilia. Now, in thrombophilia, where you are giving metformin as one of the drugs that is going to help you in the PCOS, you'll find that the uh, thrombo, uh, hypothrombophilia is good. Homo Hypo, the homocystinemia is also making its ugly head. Uh, there. So, maybe giving them adequate amount of the B complex is going to be helping them here. And uh, the hereditary ones as well as prothrombin gene mutations acquired and the antiphospholipid syndrome. The vitamin D, uh, the uh, immune pathology is the NK cells, functional impairment, HLA and the FOXP3 genes, polymorphism, anti-nuclear, anti-sperm antibodies. And the vitamin D is something that has now come up on the block, which says that deficiency of vitamin D has the VDR gene polymorphism, polymorphism VDR and vitamin D binding protein abnormal function, and of course, smoking, alcohol consumption, caffeine intake, stress, environmental factors, and pollutants. So there is a large fat fraction here, which is still unexplained infertility, which means if you have a counseling area, these are the people who need to come and be pepped up. And I feel in every IVF clinic, if you have this kind of thing, it will really help. Okay. And if you looked at the other risk factors, according to Eshri, the risk factors strongly associated with RPL are women's age over 40 years, the pregnancy loss rapidly increases. Stress associated with RPL. Maternal extreme body weight could also have a negative impact. Previous pregnancy losses, smoking and excessive alcohol. So these are some of the things that all of you have to keep in mind when you're counseling the patient. And it's always found that with the gynecologist, they are very shy to ask the ladies, do you smoke? And do you drink? It doesn't come out in the first visit just because they're wearing a big bindi and a sari. So they feel, no, no, oh, they're not going to. See, the appearance should not be. Your goal is to find out to help them. And they may come to you asking you for help, but they don't know how to ask for help. And they'll be fidgeting around. But in the first visit itself, if you build a bond, they would also have substance abuse. They would have gutka. Even if you look at the teeth, etc you'll be able to get their confidence and you start treating them. Most of the time when we say, stop this, stop this, stop this, they'll say what to eat. So what you need to do is to not say that you stop immediately and you should tell them like you're taking 10 cigarettes a day, make it two. But don't say I uh, completely stop, they will never stop. But over a period of time, during your conversation, you get the wife also to tell him, please stop. And then you will find that that will help a lot, not only in the sperm count, but also in other aspects of the family life itself. And if you look at the extreme body weight, could also have a negative impact. Get them to go for these gyms with a supervisor. Let both of them go and let them not buy the gym in the house. Because the gym will be in the house and those people will be in some place and the uh, trainer will be in another place and every day they will put that kumkum and arshanam there and they'll say, there it is, why am I not losing weight? So my dear friends, it doesn't make any difference. They have to go to the gym, be on the gym and lose weight. The other one is uh, previous pregnancy losses. You have to understand all the pregnancy losses deeply. Early pregnancy losses without heartbeat comes in a different category. Pregnancy losses that have heartbeat and then loss come in a different category. Pregnancy losses that go through about 16 to 20 weeks mid trimesters are in a different category. IUDs come in a different category. So we'll have to put them differently and find out the causes for each one of them. And 
strongly recommended would be array based comparative genomic hybridization, hybridization is recommended for recurrent pregnancy loss the apl aca thyroid screening tsh tpo and t4 and uterine anomaly screening so as it is said that you're doing the genetic the aplas and the uterine anomalies and the gpp the good practice points would be screening for beta 2 gly glycoprotein 1 antibodies as well so important for us to understand that unless we do all these things we will not be able to find out what the problem is okay we are now looking at the next one and that is to look at what is not recommended okay we tend to give a whole list of things to each and every one these have to be given selectively in indicated cases cytokine testing cytokine polymorphism natural killer cell testing hla testing pco assessment with fasting insulin and glucose ovarian reserve testing luteal phase insufficiency testing androgen testing lh hormone testing and homocysteine plasma levels testing so some of these tests need not be done in everybody in some cases when indicated needs to be done because if you give a battery of tests for them where is the money for the treatment so if everything the machine is doing what's the need for infertility specialists so this is what we should do so strongly recommended prognosis on a woman's age previous history of pregnancy and pregnancy losses overt hypothyroidism before conception should be treated second pregnant trimester pregnancy losses and suspect cervical weakness should be offered serial cervical sonographic surveillance and preconceptional low dose of folic acid to prevent neural tube defects so management of re recurrent pregnancy loss conditions where art is not required so if it's recurrent pregnancy loss you don't go and do ivf for it so with rpl this is the hereditary thrombophilias hereditary thrombophilias with mthfr genes and antiphospholipid syndrome you can have the no benefit with the low molecular weight heparin improved life birth after normalization of homocysteine and treatment with l methylfolate vitamin b6 and 12 and low molecular weight missing and pregnancy loss that's all so thyroid this is the same thing treat with the required uh, thyroid doses and luteal phase insufficiency you have all the things that you've got on the left hand side and you don't have not recommended to use progesterone insufficient evidence to recommend metformin here bromocriptin treatment decreases miscarriage but no evidence is seen for live birth rate and no evidence of association between hyper homocysteinemia and recurrent pregnancy loss and vitamin d preconceptional prophylactic vitamin d is advised vitamin d supplementation decreases the risk of preterm birth low birth weight no evidence of miscarriage and doses just safe up to 4000 units during pregnancy and lactation and no immunological biomarkers are definitely documented to cause recurrent pregnancy loss insufficient evidence for natural killer cells and cytokine abnormality only high titers of antiphospholipid antibodies can be used for selecting couples with recurrent pregnancy loss for specific conditions the shortcomings are very few high quality trials selected women with recurrent pregnancy loss based on immunological markers is to be seen so really not even floating uh, feel of free floating <coughs> guilt is also not there when they give enough of treatments so conditions where art will be needed is of course where you have parental karyotype problems and fetal karyotype problems <coughs> genetic counsel with advantages and disadvantage and possible treatment options all couples with abnormal fetal or parental karyotype may need to go for the IVF so pre-implantation genetic testing for embryos will be in this kind of fashion the PGTSR and miscarriage but not cumulative live birth rate so donor egg sperm or adoption okay all these things for congenital anomalies is already given and acquired anomalies also they can be removed and the cervical insufficiency in second trimester it can have a cervical circlage and after correcting the uterine factors 
and after that after correcting all uterine factors patients shall still be given the option of natural conception okay sperm selections antioxidants smoking alcohol obesity excessive exercise can have a negative impact on the um, that it can have a negative impact on the um, chances of live birth and therefore cessation of smoking normal birth weight limited alcohol consumption of a normal exercise pattern is recommended okay so lymphocyte therapy intravenous ivig progesterone all this should not be used as a treatment for unexplained uh, rpl may improve the live birth in women with over unexplained rec recurrent pregnancy loss may improve live birth in women with over three pregnancy loss vaginal blood loss in subsequent pregnancy and of course if you look at intralipid therapy not recommended insufficient evidence to recommend and endometrial scratching and folic acid not shown to be prevent loss in unexplained rpl so when compared to normal ovarian reserve unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss with diminished ovarian reserve had high percentage of aneuploidy in blastocyst higher incidence of ivf cycles with low embryo transfer so pgt a pgt a a potential treatment for recurrent pregnancy loss and treatment with ivf pgt we have live birth rate is better than expecting management so here's the lady after trying to start a family for so long our doctor suggested a radical approach sex on every conceivable occasion so great now method iui ivf with pgt and ivf with icsi or pixi and donor sperm or donor egg with all these alternatives fertility treatments you never know how things can turn out maybe the men get pregnant rather than the women <laughs> in art required this thing is not all cases of rpl need art there's a limited argument using art as a blanket treatment for recurrent pregnancy loss therefore the indications of art in rpl are very limited such as genetic uterine male and unexplained of course medical research is moving on and we don't know where we are going to reach here is a man with a topi and he is pulling out this baby in through a test tube okay so conclusion art in reproductive pre reproductive pregnancy loss is not a double whammy management largely depends on the etiology and risk factors in a particular woman or couple hence diagnostic approach and management should be personalized let's look at the woman let's not look at the uterus let's not look at the history first understand the woman understand her mind then you'll understand her uterus so if you need to go through this and if you have to reach there you first have to understand her it's very convoluted and then finally bingo you will reach that spot but many of us get stuck in this area only and so we would have reached there and broken through the bastions and reached some other point so try to go through these curves and you'll reach your point there okay so there you are thank you all very much thank you madam for telling so nicely the both the dual problem of rpl and art together madam should you do routine histoscope before to all the rpl going through art or you do all art histoscope diagnostic no histoscope is required before um, ivf because a good 3d ultrasound mm. will tell you everything because diagnostic histoscopy should be out of the door okay you for uh, um, implantation failure repeated pregnancy loss etc so what is the indication of histoscope in art with rpl unless you find a pathology inside you are not going to be putting a histoscope just for the sake of a histoscope you can get every information through your 3d ultrasound you don't need a histoscope even if you want to flush you can do that you want to put in the probiotics you can put in the probiotics unless you are suspecting adhesions flimsy adhesions or if you have done a surgery inside Mm -hmm. or you have done a septum resection you want to see how it is uh, uh, or for sometimes septum resection also it is required 
Mike please cervical elastograph planning for cervical elastograph see cervical elastograph will be done in few cases what has the history been done in this woman that she needs a cervical uh, elastograph if she has had cervical incompetence and that to mid trimester cervical incompetence then it is worthwhile looking at cervical uh, this thing elastograph but if the cervical histograph is done because idiopathically you feel that the cervical os is very patulous but that could be because of a paris woman and if a paris woman has had two children like that then i think you know nature yourself has told you that she can carry why should you do elastography for her and one one more question ma'am uh like many people are sending rpocs for whole exome sequencing in rpl cases so do you recommend sending products of conception of pregnancy loss for whole exome sequencing to diagnose like maybe a genetic variant from the fetus or from the parents inherited see it's like finding a needle in a haystack if you have a child that is affected and you want to see if that uh, offspring is having the same kind of defect then it's worthwhile doing a whole genome uh, this thing uh, uh, sequencing but suppose you are going to say this person who is coming to me i just want to make sure is this person allergic to this particular medicine or is this person allergic to what will be the dose that this person will require in terms of gonadotrophins to stimulate so these are the kind of algorithms that you can develop but if you say is it abnormal that abnormality has to be compared mm. to something else if it is in their family mm. so a gene probe has to be created mm. and compared to that this thing can be worked out but the personalized medicine is basically to tell you the known library of genes that they have that can be again tested against these genes but that is by no means a complete library but doing whole gene ex, uh, exome uh, testing is really not good other than the cost coming high you're not getting anything see one thing i must tell all the doctors if you are going to give a whole gene a gene ex, uh, exome uh, testing you must know how to interpret the test because you know the doctor the patient mm. goes and spends for the test mm. and if they spend for the test okay. how are you going to interpret the test mm. Thank you madam <laughs>